I was saying, thank you very much for um, the invitation from the Be Bold History Network and, and for that very kind introduction, Sam. And thank you, uh, you all, for being here. I'm just looking at the total number of participants and we've got over 100 people here with us this evening. So, I mean, that's remarkable testimony, really, to your dedication as, as history teachers. Uh, and while we're all here, um, thank you for your return to school and for the fantastic job you're doing, really, because um, uh, one level I'm really envious because I'm still interacting with my trainee teachers online. Uh, we're not allowed to go into school yet. Um, uh, uh, and at the same time, I'm really full of admiration for you all. So thank you. Um, I'm conscious there's a there's a range of expertise uh, among participants tonight. I mean, expertise in terms of um, people who are very experienced teachers, uh, but also people who are beginning teachers. Uh, and um, there's probably a whole range of expertise in terms of uh, on you know historical knowledge of the British Empire. Um, there'll be people who are real experts, maybe some people who have, you know, PhDs in aspects of the British Empire, and other people who have very limited knowledge and have, have hardly studied it. Um, so I'll try and cater for, for that kind of diverse range, but I'll, I'll kind of aim uh, th this evening at, uh, at people with maybe limited knowledge and, and limited understanding. Um, so forgive me if kind of you, you feel, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about things you already know about, at certain points. Um, I have to say just before we start that this, the, the talk I'll give this evening, I'll speak for about 40, 45 minutes and then um, as Sam said, Sean will feed questions in. Um, but it's very similar to the talk I gave to the, to the UCL Institute of Education, uh, that the workshop I gave on the 4th of February. Um, so if you've joined this session hoping for something very different and, and new, then by all means leave, um, uh, go and have a glass of wine or dinner, and um, uh, because there are some slight differences, but broadly it's, uh, it's a similar talk to the one I gave on the 4th of February uh, through, through the IOE. Um, okay, let's, let's get going. I'm going to talk about two things. Um, for about a third of the talk, uh, I'm, I'm just, just going to focus on the background to, to why the British Empire it, it now and why this focus and some of the cultural and educational context to this focus on empire at this, at this particular moment in, moment in time. And then, and then we'll come on to, the, in a way, the more interesting and relevant stuff in terms of approaches to planning and teaching. Uh, okay, and I've got, I'm going to focus on five particular historical sources and really tease out the, 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 the planning and teaching around, around different aspects of empire through these particular uh, sources in, in the uh, final two thirds of the session. Some of you may, so let, let's begin by thinking about the cultural and edu educational context for where we are in teaching of empire, the British empire at the moment. Um, some of you may have uh, visited this. This is, um, well, it seems like an age ago now, doesn't it? But it was only autumn of 2019 um, uh, when uh, Cara Walker's Fonza Americanus uh, was displayed in the turbine hall at, at Tate, Tate Modern. Uh, and I remember popping in to see this one day and just being amazed by it, really. Um, no doubt um, many of you will have got to see it as well. and. Um, it makes you feel quite nostalgic, doesn't it, for that time when we could visit exhibitions and, and things. Um, this is uh, a really powerful piece, I think. It's um, uh, a reinterpretation of Thomas Brock's uh, 1911 Victoria Memorial, the, the, the piece that stands outside uh, Buckingham Palace at the end of the Mall. Um, and in Cara Walker's reinterpretation, this is a, a monument to the victims of the British Empire and to the inhumanity and violence of Britain's uh, transatlantic slave trade. Um, remarkable piece, really huge, and uh, really kind of draws you in to these individual, individual scenes uh, within it. And I found it fascinating, actually, just to, to walk around it. Um, I think I spent an hour just walking around it, having a really good look, but also eavesdropping on people's conversations uh, around me. Um, and it was so interesting how it was just really provoking some, some, some pretty profound conversations of, about Britain's uh, imperial past. So we're being kind of 
um, we, we've been kind of challenged and, and art and uh, is a catalyst to that, I think. Um, uh, and there are many works we could choose, but this is, uh, this is just one I happen to remember and engage with last year. We're also being challenged, of course, directly uh, in other ways, and this is perhaps the most direct kind of um, image I could have chosen to kind of emphasize that the, the cultural context we find ourselves in. So we're, we're being challenged to think about the teaching of empire through what's happening on the streets, really. The 7th of June, uh, Edward Coulson's statue uh, toppled, uh, defaced, and then pushed into the harbor um, uh, at, at Bristol. And, and I think this is um, a very interesting photograph because of the juxtaposition of Colston and then the Piero Bridge just behind it, um, uh, built as a uh, as commemoration to, to, um, uh, to all those people affected by the transatlantic slave trade. Um, so these events are, these, these street protests, this and other protests are challenging us, aren't they? And are all part of this, this um, period of altered possibility, really, I think, in engaging with the uh, British en Empire. Because since the summer, then, we've seen an unprecedented public reckoning. Um, uh, well, was, I say unprecedented. I mean, the starting point in terms of public reckoning with Britain's imperial past and with the transatlantic slave trade, I think, was pretty low at the outset. Uh, but in relation to that, it has been unprecedented. You know, we've seen the the removal of names on streets, <clears throat> buildings. We've seen um, in Bristol schools renamed. Um, we've seen statues, plaques, other memorials removed from from our streets. So we're in a period of great cultural change, it seems to me, in terms of direct protest and and the the, the changes that some organisations are choosing to make in the light of that. I was really uh, no doubt some of you too read uh, Richard Evans' article. Um, in the New Statesman um, after uh, the, the protests of, of last summer. He made a very important point. I'd urge you to read this article, the full article, if you, if you haven't. But Evans made a really important point, I think, um, that, that the statues only get us so far. And this is a quote from his, his article. He said, the statues erected at the height of imperial power and prejudice do not belong in 21st century Britain. Uh, I would really concur with that. Uh, but, he says, toppling monuments uh, will not help us properly understand our past or resolve uh, our present uh, troubles. And I think I really concur with that, too. And it's our job, I guess, as history teachers to go be beyond those monuments, isn't it? And, and belong beyond that street process. There's another article I thought that was, uh, again, really, really powerful uh, in The Guardian by Martin Kettle on the 11th of June, in which he said, the failure to look the history of empire in the eye is not the only neglected issue in Britain's enduringly delusional relationship with its past, but it is the one that more than any other impoverishes modern Britain's understanding of itself and the world of 2020 and 2021. I think that's a, a quote that needs to be shared with all uh, history teachers, really. That phrase at Britain's enduringly delusional relationship with its past um that's what we're about really as history educators isn't it taking our students be beyond the delusional relationship that might be all around them in the uh, in the culture um and of course we've been we've been challenged by journalists by his historians like richard evans um and and um uh most recently um, I've been challenged by this book. I don't know if you've read uh, Empire Land by Sathnam uh, Sanghera, but again, um, a, another um, a work that's really challenging us, uh, not, not only to understand um, how Britain has shaped the world over um, four centuries, uh, but also the way, but also how empire uh, still shapes the ways in which Britain regards itself now. So. I'd recommend that book if you if you haven't read it. So we're being the cultural context seems to me um, to be quite diverse and it's challenging us in different ways, but it's creating um, what I think of as a period of altered possibility in terms of engaging young, young people with the history of the, the British Empire. And what's helping as well to create this this context of altered possibility, I think, is what we're doing in history education. And 
and in a way what we've been doing for some time. I, I, I was really struck um, when I read in 2007 Kay Trail's piece in Teaching History, Teaching History Hurts. Um, no doubt many of you have read this, read this too. And it was great actually recently at a, at a subject interest group um, at the IOE, um, you know, public one um, online, um, to be able to catch up with, with Kay's work and hear her speak again. Uh, this is her most recent book, uh, Teaching History to Black Students in the United Kingdom. And I think what makes her research so powerful uh, is the way in which she has revealed what it's like to engage with history for some of our students, um, particularly um, from her original research, uh, African Carib students of African Caribbean heritage, her, her PhD initially that they uh, teaching history article was based on, were, was focused on um, uh, students in London schools of African Caribbean heritage and their mums. Interestingly, uh, that makes that adds another uh, fascinating uh, dimension to it. But what Kay talks about is the inside of feel, the inside feel of students um, sitting in history lessons and um, seething in, in in some lessons because of the way in which history, their history, is being taught. Um, she speaks of the difficulty of disconnecting from the past um, for some students and, and the ongoing trauma of history lessons. This really, uh, when I first encountered it in 2007, really disturbed me and shifted my thinking and shook me up in terms of the way um, I and my school were then teaching about the transatlantic slave trade. And research has continued since, you know, some important more recent research from uh, Rebecca Harris um, uh, and Rachel Reynolds on, on the history curriculum and its personal connection to students of, of minority ethnic backgrounds. Um, uh, Nahida Doherty's work, I think, really interesting in terms of uh, the, the looking at a, a racial migra uh, microaggressions framework and black students experience of Black History Month and Black History. And then more recently, uh, Julia Huber and Alison Kitson's work, um, looking at the relationship between um, national narrative and uh, students' identity uh, in Britain. So, you know, we're being urged to kind of address some of these issues through educational research like this um, and important reports. Um, we've had three really important reports over the last, uh, well, during 1918 and nine, uh, 2018 and 2019, uh, the RHS report that you'll be familiar with, maybe the Tide Runnymede report less familiar, with, but you can um, download this online and I'd urge you to, to read it because perhaps of all, all three reports, it's the Tide Runnymede one, which addresses more, more directly the teaching of uh, the British Empire in schools. So I'd really recommend that, but also the, uh, a lesser known report, but really powerful Cumberland Lodge report on teaching difficult histories and, and positive identities. So all these reports, it's just really important, I think, that these reports don't just lie on shelves and gather dust, but they actually impact change and impact change in universities and, and, uh, and schools. Uh, but as well, the, the kind of ca another catalyst for change is coming from our students. Um, and this manifests itself in different ways. This was January 2020. Uh, when students at the Advocacy Academy in Brixton, uh, as, as part of their campaign, fill in the blank, stage this um, hoax in, in, in London, distributing uh, the Metro newspaper that they'd printed, uh, claiming that the DfE had announced that the teaching of British Empire should be mandatory for all Key Stage 3 um, students. Um, so, that, so the catalyst here is coming from our students as well. And I'm sure many of you have, you know, just, just heard the demand for um, uh, for a more culturally responsive history from uh, your own students. And the good thing is that some amazing work has, is already happening. Um, uh, and uh, in a whole range of contexts. Um, forgive me if you're not on this list and you should be, um, but these are just the people who have influenced me in terms of teaching uh, a more culturally responsive curriculum and a more diverse uh, curriculum, and in some cases specifically the British Empire, uh, since uh, last September. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
And I, I, I've divided these people up into different colors. So you can see the, the people on the left in brown at the top. These are all historians who um, I've listened to or, or read. Um, historians who, and this is not just historians writing about the British Empire. I mean, the list would be much, much longer, really, uh, because um, you know, the research is just phenomenal. I mean, we were talking at the beginning um, uh, about the amazing uh, recent recent books, some of which I'll share with you this evening. But these are just these, these are just historians who uh, are engaging with history educators, and um, and um, yeah, thank you to them for doing this because um, engaging with academic historians, I think, is 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 really important for us as, as history teachers and educators. The people on the uh, mm -hmm. uh, in green um, are uh, uh, history educators, um, history teacher trainers, uh, all of whom are doing some remarkable work. Um, in their universities and, and, and beyond in different contexts. Um, Robin Whitburn, for example, in terms of justice to history, uh, Helen Snelson through the, through the Historical Association and so on. And then on the right hand side, a whole range of uh, history teachers who are doing fantastic things. Um, some uh, at the beginning of that journey or kind of four or five years in, um, uh, some like Martin Spafford at the end there who devoted a whole lifetime to this. Um, so I think we're at a really good point because there's a whole range of people doing really interesting things in terms of um, teaching the British Empire. What I'm not going to focus on this evening uh, are a couple of dimensions to this that I think are really important. Um, uh, one is uh, the, the planning and teaching of black British history um, in terms of people's experience in this country. Um, and uh, lots of people on this list have, have made an absolutely invaluable contribution to this. But my focus this evening is not so much on the Black British experience um, here. Um, it's specifically on the teaching of the British Empire, nor is it on um, wider world histories. We'll, we'll touch on that and, and maybe discuss that at the end, the relationship between uh, other cultures and civilizations and the teaching of the British Empire. Um, but in my view, um, we need to address both, actually, um, because uh, overall, I think there's a, a lack of a focus on wider world histories in our curriculum in this country. And there's some really great work going on on that. Um, just one example, I can think of, you know, the great work that went on in response to Peter Frankopan's book and the Silk Roads, you know, uh, but a whole range of different contexts um, where that's happening. And, uh, but that's not my focus this evening, not my primary focus anyway. I'm focused specifically on teaching of uh, British Empire. Okay, so we're in a really good position, I think. And, um, you know, the forces are there, both educational forces and wider, uh, wider cultural forces that, are, that, that, you know, that explain why so many people have joined this session uh, this evening. I think that's all I want to say at this point on the, the cultural and curriculum context. There'll be specific things that we can address at the end in terms of, you know, maybe the specifics of the cultural of the curriculum, excuse me, context. Um, but really, I want them to, to focus for the rest of the session, the bulk of the session on approaches to planning and teaching. And I'm going to touch on a range of things here. Uh, I want to share some exciting scholarship with you that has inspired me. Um, I want to talk about how, how we some of the things we consider when we when we're looking to find a focus on what to teach about in the British Empire um, on how we might structure and en inquiries and I'm going to do this through as I said earlier through looking at five particular um, historical sources I think uh, uh, the background to this though comes from um, uh, work I was doing some time ago now with um, it, specifically with, uh, writing a textbook on the British Empire with Jamie Byram and, and Chris Culpin and this way back actually I think the first edition came out in 2004 um, and then a, a, this is a second edition that came out in 2008 and it is still in print and, and as far as I know still the, the only uh, textbook devoted to the British Empire, at, at, solely to the British, teaching the British Empire at Key Stage 3. Um, and a lot of it still stands, I think, um, and, and still looks okay to use in the classroom. I'm sure if we were writing it now, we'd produce a very different book. Um, but I, I just want to talk about this at the outset because um, as a result of it, uh, well, 
J Jamie and Chris and I spent a long time in this very shed at the bottom of my garden um, arguing uh, it, um, um, about what should go in the book. We had some great discussions, uh, long, long discussions about what, as you can imagine, about what should go in, and, and which are the very same conversations that history departments have about what should we include when we're teaching the British Empire. And as a result of those discussions, um, Jamie and I wrote an article in Teaching History, uh, which we call professional wrestling in the history department, because that's what it felt like, deciding what should go in our book. Um, and one thing I thought it might just be good to go back to and share with you this evening are the list of criteria then that we came up with for choosing what should go in the book and what should go in um, a history curriculum, say at Key Stage 3. And these are the questions we asked ourselves. And I mean, obviously, if we were all together in a room, uh, or even if there were fewer of us, I'd, I'd kind of put you into pairs and get you to talk about these now and come up with some, 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 some of these criteria for selection that you think are particularly important. But we won't do that. But I think I, I'd just like to read through them and, and so that you can kind of internalize them. And as we're reading through them, could you just get an idea of which ones of these you personally think are important? So, you know, you, you could rank them, we could rank them, um, um, uh, and we could, you know, discuss each one, because each one is important. But as I go through, just, just if you could just pick out the two or three, perhaps, that you think, uh, personally, are the most important criteria that you, uh, for you in terms of selecting content when we're when thinking about what to teach the British Empire. So let, let's just kick off um, with, with chronology. How, how, how important do you think it is to give students a fair sense of the, the rise and the peak and the fall of empire? That understanding the overall, that it changes over time. Um, to give a sense of the, the spread of empire, um, the geographical spread. So where do we put our focus um, and how important is it to develop an understanding of the geography of the British Empire, of its coherence, uh, of a framework, a kind of overall narrative in which all the parts are held together? How important do you think it is to go into depth, uh, to give students a strong sense of, you know, the histor particular historical situations and processes, uh, the reality, uh, you know, a sense that this is a history um, about real people making real decisions, real uh, in real places with real consequences. You know that that kind of fine grain of history that that is often uh, what we use as history teachers to get students interested and and um, and to develop broader understanding. So that that depth, how important is that for you? Um, equally, the complexity. You know. Um, not only is the history messy, but this is a, a really complex history because it's a phenomenon that lasted for, for over 400 years and, uh, and uh, occurred in many different places uh, and involved millions of people. So that complexity, its impact and legacy, how important is that um, for you? Uh, how important is it uh, that students should um, engage with some what, what you might term iconic um, elements of history. Um, so some names, for example. Does it matter, in your opinion, if your students have never um, heard of Robert Clive uh, or Cook um, or Walter Raleigh? Um, interpretations. How is it, how important is it, if, if say you have three or four inquiries on the empire, how important is it that one or more of those focuses on different interpretations of empire for you? And the variety of histories. Um, you know, I, I look at some of the A-level uh, specifications on empire and think they look pretty dire actually in terms of the domination of political and military history. Um, but how important is that variety of history for you in terms of social, cultural, aesthetic history as well? Um, diversity experience in terms of rulers and rules. Um, the ethics, how important is it to allow your students to reflect appropriately on the, the ethical and social, the ethical, social, cultural issues in their historical context? How important is that for you? Uh, and linking um, the, the history they teach in relation to empire to students' identity uh, or multiple identities is perhaps better than, than singular there. Um, and then I guess it's always important, isn't it, to make it motivating and to think about progression. 
well this is a really long list isn't it i think it's a i hope you it's a really useful list for you i mean you can go back to the original article we put this list in a, in a panel in the article uh that you can get by the the, the ha website um I, I think, I mean, I use this list subsequently with my own history department um, in relation to all our content, actually, so that we have a really good understanding of where we come from and what we value uh, as a history department. But I think it's, I hope you find it useful in terms of just how you prioritise and um, uh, on what the thinking is behind your curriculum in terms of teaching empire. Three important things, though, I, I think. Um, whatever criteria you think are most important. One is that we treat it historically, that we avoid kind of moralizing empire. Um, we avoid using empire as a proxy for arguing about Britain now. This is quite different from kind of considering an ethical dimension, which I'll come on to later, but I think we need to treat it historically. We need to explore the complexity in terms of the complexity in time and place, as I mentioned. Um, uh, and I think we need a certain specificity, really. Uh, I'll be sharing some examples of this in a minute. Um, particular places, particular contexts, maybe even particular objects that I'll, I'll suggest, and particular individuals. Uh, and through these, we need to explore the complexity of empire. And I think as history teachers, we need to be brave. I mean, this fits in perfectly with the ethos of the uh, Beeble History Nest Network, doesn't it? Um, in teaching that the British Empire, more than anything perhaps, we do need to be bold, which is presumably why you're all here. Uh, we need to tackle the difficulties. Um, we, we need to engage students, I think, um, with the fact that so much of the British Empire was based on greed, was based on um, racism uh, and white supremacy, uh, was based on extreme violence. Um, these are difficult issues to teach about. Uh, but I don't think we should shy away from them because the safest place to tackle them is in the history classroom. Um, and part of that difficulty too is, um, you know, as, as Kay Trail's work did, um, addressing the ongoing legacy of, of, of empire in, in British society. These are all part of the difficulties. I think we need to be uh, risk takers um, to a certain extent as history teachers. We certainly need to be brave, bold, and not to shy away from those difficulties. So those are three important principles, and I'll share some practical ways now about how we might do that. Okay, so here's the first of my four, of my five sources um, as a way into teaching about the British Empire, and some of you will be familiar with this, uh, uh, no doubt. It's reproduced in textbooks sometimes um, uh, and available through a Google search. This is the Imperial Federation map of the world uh, from 1886. Um, produced um, uh, as part of the colonial and Indian exhibition that was held in London as part of Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee. Uh, and the map was produced, um, you know, as a souvenir uh, for, for people attending the exhibition. Um, and its purpose was really to celebrate empire. Uh, if you like, it's an official view of empire. Um, then that the biggest empire that the world had, had ever known um, and I think using it with our students, um, we can get them to understand a lot about in official imperial attitudes at, the, at that time in terms of getting them to think about what this map uh, reveals. Um, and when I, I've used it many times with students, actually, usually kind of with year eight or nine students. Um, and I think the first thing to do is just say, what, what do you notice that interests you? Yeah, just, just give them free reign. And then we can push them to start making inferences and, and, and push them to things that they uh, don't initially focus on. So some things are obvious in terms of the pictures surrounding it and so on, uh, and, and, and the, the area is shade, shaded red. But what, what students uh, often overlook, for example, is this map inset at the top there, um, which is quite handy really, showing the change in uh, the um, British Empire from the late 18th century to the late 19th century and that can generate a lot of this useful discussion with with students so so it's a, it's a map that really gives the students their bearings in terms of change and the overall geography of the british um, em empire um, and we can get them to think about these words at the top freedom fraternity federation 
and uh, help them to unpick what those might might mean, what that says about imperial unity and British British official attitudes. And we can get them to focus on these lines across the oceans, which are all very interesting. I can think what they might represent and, and so on and, um, and where they're going to and from. Um, they may know actually that if they've had good geography teaching that this um, that Britain is made to look bigger than it actually is. Um, this is Mercator's projection of the world, not Peter's. Um, uh, but if they haven't been taught that in geography lessons, I think it's a very good thing to uh, to get them to think about and to, to point out to them. Um, uh, but partic but what a good thing to do is actually to get them to relate the relate the images to kind of different places in empire, which they enjoy doing and and, and thinking about. Um, all these wonderful slides, uh, images at the bottom of people, of, of goods, of flora and, and fauna, getting them to relate those to different places within the uh, British Empire. So we can we can really, through this map, develop a, a really rich understanding, I think, of uh, imperial attitudes in Britain of the late 19th century. Um, but then it's rather good to kind of um, say, tell them a little bit about the man who made this map, the graphic artist who constructed it. Um, as some of you may know this, but his name was uh, Walter Crane. Walter Crane. And uh, Crane was a socialist um, and a critic of the British Empire. And in a way, that's all you need to tell your students. Um, uh, and then ask them, to look for any signs in Crane's map? Uh, has he dropped anything in here to suggest that maybe the empire was quite bad for some people? Um, and what they, what they do notice is, is this Indian man here struggling to carry this great heavy bale of, uh, of cotton. Um, um, what, what you need to point them to um, and give them some magnifying glasses to, to look at is um, the Atlas's sash here, which probably you can't even see on the screen. Usually when I, I've used this map with, with students, I've laminated it and given them a kind of A3 copy uh, and also borrowed a set of magnifying glasses from the science department. And, um, uh, and what they notice, are the, the words on uh, Atlas's sash, holding up the world and holding up Britannia, are human labor. Uh, maybe Crane sneaked those words in and made them really tiny, you know, so the approvers wouldn't notice them. But uh, I think it, it's good to point out these things to your students and, and give them that historical context. Because one of the, th one of the important things in teaching about British Empire, I think, is that um, not everyone had the same view on it. And even at the, uh, towards the height of empire in the, in the late 19th century, uh, there were people who uh, disapproved of it uh, in general, and, and certainly people who disapproved of particular aspects of it. And Crane was one of those who disapproved of it um, in general. So the map kind of begins to unpick the complexity in terms of people's attitudes uh, at the time. So that's the first source I'll uh, share with you. My, my second one is this. Again, these images might be familiar to some of you. The John White um, watercolours in the British Museum, uh, as far as I know, are not on permanent display, uh, but you, you can obtain these from uh, really high resolution images from the, uh, um, from the British Museum. And they're, a ma they're of massive cultural significance. You know? um, I think probably the equivalent of the, of the photographs we received um, a couple of weeks ago from Mars. Um, because these, these are extraordinary, if you think about it. Uh, these are the first images um, by English people of Native Americans from the 1580s. Um, and they were produced by the artist John White. Uh, White accompanied um, uh, Walter Raleigh's uh, uh, colony. Raleigh didn't go, of course, but his, his colonial expedition to, uh, to establish England's first colony at Roanoke in 1585. Um, he'd also been on the, the recce uh, expedition before that in, in 1584. And then he visited North America, uh, I think five times between 
in total between 15 uh, 84 and 1590 and produced a whole series of watercolors they're really wonderful to use with your students um, the, um, the kids really enjoy not only depictions of people but depictions of the flora and fauna as well um, he, he um, produces wonderful images of things like flying fish imagine you know as a, as a Elizabethan Englishman seeing flying fish for the first time as you cross the Atlantic um, and seeing pineapples and eating pineapples for the first time and and, um, and crab, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 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 land crabs as well is another thing that he, he paints beautifully. Imagine seeing those for the first time. And, and th these watercolours are amazing, really. There are lots of them and they're of massive cultural significance and it's really good to engage students with them. The, the, this, the ones of the people obviously are the most interesting. And here we have, um, White's depiction of the um, the wife and daughter of the Pomeroy chief. Um, uh, the mother has injured her arm; it's in a sling. Um, she's fetching water in a calabash. Interestingly, the daughter has got a little English dolly of a gentlewoman there, presumably given to her by one of the colonists. Um, a really interesting picture to unpick uh, with students. Uh, this, and at one level, it's these are quite sensitive. Uh, depictions, you know, um, the, the Algonquin people uh, are shown as um, people with a culture, um, people who farm, uh, people who ra raise children, um, people who beautify themselves, um, and people who have a relationship with the, the English, with the English colonists. Um, but of course, at the same time, you can develop an understanding of your students that White's images are also pieces of um, colonial propaganda. He's trying to encourage colonists to move to North America. Um, uh, and so at one level, they're quite sanitized um, images too. So these are really rich, I think, for unpicking lots of understanding um, um, uh, about the beginning of the uh, British Empire. Um, and I, I used them ages ago in the book we did, actually, when I, I structured an inquiry um, around the question, why did England's first colony fail? And I've often used this on training. With, I use it with my trainees at the IOE and in different contexts. Not so much for a focus on the British Empire, but just because it's a kind of very standard and straightforward narrative to analysis inquiry focused on causal understanding. But really, really rich in terms of understanding the different attitudes and motivations and experiences of different colonists and the way in which it quickly um, result that the whole expedition uh, and establishment of the colony quickly results in conflict and, and terrible uh, terrible loss of life and trauma um, for both groups actually so it unpicks some of those difficult histories but um, more most recently um, either privilege to attend uh, some training uh, that Matt Stamford organized and, and um, Kerry Apps organized from uh, uh, through the school's history project uh, where they invited uh, historians to speak about the latest research on um, uh, um, the first empire in, in North America and um, I then engaged with some really interesting uh, books I'd read Gaskell's book actually but I hadn't read Susan Dwyer Amerson's book Caribbean Exchanges um, uh, I'd really recommend that, uh, nor uh, Karen uh, Kuffman's book on the, the myth of Pocahontas. They're all fantastic reads and I really recommend them. Um, so I started kind of deepening my um, understanding of uh, Britain's first colonies in North America and the Caribbean through, through engaging with these historians in that, that taught session, that CPD session, and then digging into the history. Anyway, the first book I read afterwards was um, uh, Gaskell's and then I went on to Amerson's book and I uh, sat in this very place and read it and um, uh, was amazed when I um, opened the book and began to read the introduction and if you don't mind I'm just going to read you the uh, the first two paragraphs of uh, Susan Amerson's book Caribbean Exchanges um, because I expected it to begin um, well, maybe in London, maybe in North America, maybe well, I kind of anticipate in the Caribbean, but no. Where did she begin her book? In the village just over the hill behind me here, in the village of East Coker. Um, 
the next village to me in Somerset. And Alison wrote, in May 1692, the parish clerk of East Coker, Somerset, recorded the baptism of Thomas William Hellier Esquire, Blackamoor. The clerk was apparently so startled by this unusual event that he inserted a note above the, uh, above the record, reinforcing Thomas's identity, a black of William Hellier Esquire. Two years earlier, John Hellier, that's William's brother, had promised to send his brother William two young Negro children by the next ship to serve as household servants or slaves. John was in Jamaica at their father's plantation, Bybrook, some 50 miles north of Spanish Town. William was in East Coker, about 35 miles south of Bristol, where their father, um, where their father was the squire. The Helliers did not baptize slaves in Jamaica, but like other families, they baptized slaves in England. We don't know whether John only sent Thomas, whether another child was sent but died before being baptized, or if the second child made it to England, but for some reason was not baptized. Whether alone or with another child from the plantation, Thomas's journey from Bybrook home to about 110 slaves and less than a dozen white servants to his new home, a pretty Somerset village of some 500 inhabitants covered more than four and a half thousand miles. The cultural, the cultural distance is immeasurable. The village was dominated by Coca Court here. The home of the Helliers is now, um, uh, upper end apartment. Um, um, yeah, it's on the hill just above the church where Thomas was baptized, Anderson tells us. Thomas was probably the only person of African ancestry in this parish. We don't know what news reached Bybrook about Thomas after his arrival in England. He disappears from the record after his baptism. Nine years later, however, Dr. John Hall, then overseer of Bybrook, ended a letter to the same William Hellier with a short note stating that Betty, a Negro, asks if her son is living with you and sends her love. That to me is so incredibly moving. Imagine, you know, that, that mother having to send one or more, maybe, of her sons to England and writing through the overseer of the plantation nine years later, not knowing whether her young son was alive or dead and sending her love in case he was alive. That's so incredibly poignant and moving, it seems to me. Um, and it meant even more to me because this is a village just over the hill. And before I read Amazon's book, I had no idea that the Helliers were um, uh, slave traders and plantation owners. Um, the history of empire is on our doorsteps, even in rural Somerset. And it certainly is if you teach in London, isn't it? Uh, I, I just um, some before last, I remember visiting one of my trainee teachers um, and I was early, you know, and, and I walked from the school because I wanted to see the new Spurs ground, even just look at it from the outside. Um, so I had a wander from, from the school to the Spurs ground and back again. Nearly every street in, in this network of late 19th century streets around the school where the students lived was named after a battle uh, or uh, a, an, a British imperialist. And I wonder whether that was in the curriculum. No, so did children know who these people were, uh, who their streets were named after? I think if we look hard enough, we can we can usually find lots of local connections with with empire, but it, it came as quite a surprise to to find it so close and and for it to be so poignant. There's an amazing collection of letters, by the way, which I'm going to research and share with local schools here in the Somerset archive um, uh, throughout the 17th and early 18th century from the plantation overseers and, and between brothers, you know, the Helliers one is one, 
um, uh, one on Jamaica. So yeah, maybe that's a good starting point then, thinking about the history that's on your doorstep. Um, but in terms of the wider reading I did, it may it really made me think at a deeper level than I had when I first wrote the Roanoke Inquiry about you know what's important to bring out here. And I think these things are things importantly to bring out in planning an inquiry on the early empire. And the focus could be anywhere, couldn't it? I mean, I was thinking you may want to develop an inquiry along these lines that in a way covers a lot of ground, um, but nothing perhaps in depth but i mean that's why i put the helia plantation at the end here um you know a case study of the caribbean linked to a local context i mean you could do something like that can you or you know that the, the helia plantation could be the starting point and you could teach all of this rich history through that perhaps um but if you're going for something that's quite in a way overview like this you would need to think about the depth and those particular people, particular places, and how you can generate that interest in the particular that's so important in history in any of those contexts. But um, I think the exploration of the East is fascinating, you know. Um, it's often overlooked, but, you know, Ralph Fitch's amazing journey to India and the Far East in the 1580s, um, before, you know, 20 years be or 15 years before the East India Company, anyway, this, this kind of first expedition, you know, and the encounters that these, he and his, his colleagues have with, um, uh, with the Portuguese, uh, they're imprisoned, you know, in Goa, uh, and then he treks on alone north and then travels alone for four and a half years and returns alive to England, you know, having explored this Eastern territory and noted um, some marvellous things, you know. It's fascinating history for to share with students, I think. Okay, so, so that's my second uh, object, really, those John White images. Um, just keeping a check on that. Oh, blimey, the time is going ahead. I'll, I'll speed up so that we finish by eight o'clock and then we can uh, take some questions. Um, this is uh, the third of my images, and it may be one that's familiar to you. It's one that was recommended to me by Richard Woff, who was head of uh, children and younger audiences at the British Museum. And, and, um, uh, and Richard asked me to... Um, to develop some work for their website, Teaching History with a Hundred Objects, I'm sure a lot of you use, and I put together some materials um, and, and, um, around using the Akan drum as a starting point for the transatlantic slave trade. And um, later, actually, with a really useful suggestion of my colleague Robin Whitburn, originally it was what would the Akan drum, or what did the Akan drum see, um, changing it to say made a lot more sense because of this in Asante culture some of you know this th these drums were for communication um, but taking a, a drum uh, an artifact um, uh, and using this as the medium through which students can demonstrate their knowledge and understanding allowed us to address some really quite sensitive and difficult issues but created sufficient distance I think from this history so the drum is I think is a really useful start a really useful vehicle um, students writing in role as the drum and I think it's incredibly helpful that you know there's this amazingly positive start you know this is moving away from the kind of victimhood uh, um, focus here to one that's much more positive uh, the place of the drum in African in Asante culture um, there's great materials that you can use with this because Casey Hayford did a great series on, on uh, African um, African um, history and focused on the Asante in one of the programs. So it's all on YouTube you can use. Okay, and it allows us to pick up the legacy. You know, here's the drum originally uh, thought to be a North American drum, uh, then identified in the early, early 20th century as uh, a West African drum and still in the British Museum. So what does the drum have to say about its legacy? Moving on, um, I think there's some great Many people, I think, have moved on and done some really good thinking about their teaching of the transatlantic slave trade in response to Kay's, Kay's research. Um, this, I think, is a very useful starting uh, point for principles uh, developed through the HA Fellowship on transatlantic slavery. And you can find a lot of really good materials on the on on the um, HA website, following on from the from from the fellowship. Um, but these are some of the things we shouldn't ignore, I think, in, in teaching about the transatlantic slave trade. And some fantastic research to, um, um, uh, to base this on. Um, 
some of it going back. I mean, Jim Walvin's book's quite dated now from 1993, but still I think uh, uh, really this was the first book that really enlightened my thinking and developed my thinking uh, in, in teaching about Britain's uh, um, uh, long history of slavery. Uh, more recently, to, uh, Toby Green and uh, Patrick Scanlon, who uh, Sam tells me is speaking on the Be Bold Network on the 4th of May. So that's something really to look forward to. So my, my thinking, like your thinking, moves on because of engaging with the scholarship, and that's really, really important. Uh, my fourth object, quickly, is um, this amazing Moogle miniature. And again, these are all uh, obtainable from the uh, teaching history with 100 objects uh, at the British Museum. Uh, the weighing of uh, Prince Quran, um, uh, who will later become Emperor Shah Jahan, the man who would, uh, this is him there, oh, sitting cross-legged, being weighed, who would build the Taj Mahal. And there's his father, Jahangir. Um, being weighed against the, these gold, these um, uh, satin bags filled with gold coins, and then the silks and the other goods in front of him, and uh, and after the weighing, this would be either used for building projects at the imperial palace or distributed to to courtiers and and to the poor too. It makes a great start, I think, uh, to to think about Britain's relationship with uh, with the Mughal Empire. Uh, I think we need to start often not with uh, the British. Uh, but with these other amazing cultures and civilizations. And something really important to think about is the relationship between your enquiries uh, uh, in your curriculum on, on uh, wider world cultures and civilizations and your teaching of the British Empire. If you're not teach, if you don't have a discrete uh, inquiry on the Mughal Empire, I think it's really important that that's where you start. Um, in terms of developing an understanding of the sophistication and the wealth and the size of this empire compared to, you know, the teeny weeny English who had really nothing to trade, worth trading with these people um, in, in, in the late uh, 16th and early 17th century. And at first the Mughal emperors weren't interested in them at all. Uh, Jamie developed a really good approach, I think, in, and many teachers have said they've used this. Um, using hidden histories to explore these bigger stories over time. Uh, I think now I'd broaden this out to, you know, start in 1600 and end with partition. Um, these are the ones that Jamie chose, but I know many people who've taken this approach and, and have adapted it using their own micro stories to, um, to explore bigger changes and continuities um, over time. And some great literature to base this on, some fantastic recent research. Um, uh, Priyamvada Gopal's book, which doesn't focus in, entirely on India, but has lots of chapters focus on uh, resistance to empire in India. Uh, and most recently, uh, that I've read, uh, uh, Kavita Puri's fantastic book on partition voices, um, based on interviews with people living in this country who experienced partition, um, many of whom now are in, the, in their 80s and 90s, of course, and really, really important to trap these uh, voices and to record them. Um, and I know some schools in Bradford, for example, have done great work on this, um, encouraging their, their own students to, to engage in oral history uh, with people who experience partition. Uh, and that's how, we could, what, how I've used um, the scholarship to kind of try and find a focus. Uh, so different things emphasised by different people. But I think what's interesting is the aggression and the self-interest of the of the uh, e e EIC, uh, the, the, the extreme violence that John Wilson emphasizes, uh, the in, in Indian perspectives and experience emphasized by Gopal, and, and uh, the, the, the violence, the memory of that, and the, leg the ongoing legacy of partition in, in Britain today from, from Puri's work. Mm -hmm. Amazing scholarship, I think. Um, Dalrymple, Dalrymple has been really significant in this, and, and I think he gets to the heart of it here that whatever we're teaching uh, in relation to the empire, it needs to be full of human stories, of successes, of struggles, of grief, of anguish, of despair. And I, I'd really urge you to, to get these human stories into your teaching of empire, to make it real, really, to help your students feel it from the perspective of different, different people. And finally, um, you recognize this, the plaques are well known, of course. Um, um, uh, and again, this is another one that I, I think, or one very like it, is, is part of the teaching history with a hundred objects. Uh, here we've got the Ober of Benin, surrounded by his um, uh, 
uh, courtiers, his officials, and up here, Portuguese traders. Um, I think he's sucking his thumb here, even. And um, um, but the whole history of these, I think, in relation to empire, uh, has really, for me anyway, helpfully been contextualised by um, uh, by Dan Hicks in his recent book, because really on, on the website and in the British Museum, um, the, the 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 extreme violence that was part of the way in which these artifacts were acquired. Um, it is not really acknowledged in any depth. I don't think we we have a kind of sanitized view of how these how these objects were acquired. And what um, Dan Hicks engages us with is the on, as he describes it the ongoing trauma. Um, we need, he argues, a restitution. And I think that's particularly interesting because Hicks is an insider. You know? Um, he's Professor of Archaeology at Oxford University, but also a curator at the Pitt Rivers uh, Museum. And he argues very strongly uh, for the repatriation of these cultural artefacts. He argues very strongly that nothing should be present in the collections of European uh, ethnographic museums, North American museums. Nothing should be present against the will of others. Um, and as long as they are present, uh, he argues, we we in the West are prolonging uh, the, the, the trauma. Um, he argues that museums should be a sites of conscience um, where you know, departures of these artifacts and repatriation can be marked by new creative acts of, of um, artistic reconstruction. Uh, and I think it, it, my view is that it's really important to engage our students with these contemporary debates uh, and this is very different from moralizing in a vacuum, I think. And it made me think, well, if I wanted to teach about this aspect of kind of late 19th century colonization, what you know used to be termed the scramble for Africa, um, how would I do it? And I think um, I would definitely want to uh, focus it on the art of Benin um, to, to to give that a, a real kind of aesthetic start, if you like, in terms of a, another culture and civilization, but would not shy away from sharing with students the extreme violence, the fact that, you know, Gatling guns were fired indiscriminately on the way to Benin City in the bush and that civilians were killed uh, because the British soldiers were afraid of, of, of being ambushed. Um, and, and engage students with the debate. Um, uh, with, with the debate that Hicks is contributing to. In his view, these museums are brutish for prolonging the violence and that what we need to do is to face up to the inhumanity. Um, so my view is we need to be brave, we need to be bold, uh, we need to be risk takers. And based on the historical knowledge that we've developed through our inquiries, we need to be engaging students with contemporary debates. Because if we don't do it in our history classrooms, they're going to engage with it out there. Uh, history doesn't just happen uh, in classrooms or university lectures. It isn't just what historians write about. Um, um, there's a whole, as you're fully aware, a whole culture of history out there. And I think it's important that we engage our students with it. Um, and to finish, um, th these are the things that I think are particularly important. Um, I'm just really enjoying continuing to develop my subject knowledge um, on uh, uh, British imperial history uh, and, and really finding this is the starting point for planning engaging with the scholarship. Um, we need to think about making it matter to our students, I think, in terms of identities, their multiple identities, um, as I've just described, developing their opinion forming and maybe even action in relation to this. Um, planning, as I, I would always say, wouldn't I, planning meaningful, challenging, engaging inquiries, um, devising carefully sequenced learning activities. What, what I think I've talked quite a lot about is the way we need to think very carefully teaching empire about balancing in-depth and, and, and outline history and, the, and, and building depth, but also outline knowledge. And most importantly, I think finding the universal in the particular by engaging our students with real human stories. Um, and I'll leave you with this, really. I think as history educators, we have a vital role to play in building knowledge and understanding of the British Empire. 
and that we urgently need to help our young people to confront the complexities of Britain's imperial past and its ongoing legacy. And that only with this knowledge and understanding can they, and it will be them, who are creating a better future. I'm sorry to run over uh, slightly, but thank you. Um, I'd be really interested in your thoughts, questions, comments, and so on. Thank you very much. Obviously, and you mentioned this a bit in your talk, but tackling the violence is, is tricky. And I think that's something that possibly make, has led to some teachers to shy away or certainly to kind of be nervous about teaching the empire um, in all of its guises. So what might your advice be to teachers who are unsure about tackling tricky subjects like violence perpetrated by um, people, actors of empire? That's a really good question, Sam. No. Um, and I think my advice would be, I, I do think there's been very good practice developed around this on, for example, Holocaust education. And if you speak to any of the Holocaust educators, um, for example, at the Centre of Holocaust Education at the IOE, UCL IOE, their advice is simply to tell it how it was, really. Not, um, their advice would be not, not to use, for example, horrible images. There's no need for that. But, uh, and maybe not to go into, you know, so much detail to make it graphic and horrible. Um, but simply to tell it how it was. And I think, I, I think we need to just be very careful about the, you know, about my, what the, the, the snippet of knowledge I shared with you in response to the attack on Benin, the way in which Gatling guns were just fired into the bush because the road to Benin, you know, the bush came right up to the road. The British soldiers were, were scared of um, uh, being attacked and they fired therefore indiscriminately, killing men, women and children on the way to Benin City. Um, I didn't know that. I read it in Hicks's book. And I think that's something I would share with my students. I mean, it often depends on their age, doesn't it? Um, but, uh, and it's quite a shocking thing to hear, but I, I do think we need to just bring it home to them um, that the extreme violence and the ultra violence sometimes and and just say it how it was really without going into graphic detail um, and the same you know the same teaching the transatlantic slave trade yeah absolutely um, there are loads of questions coming in on the Q&A which is great so I think let's in the interest of time um, let's go straight to that I, I'm going to hand over to Sean who's going to take us through the Q&A Okay, so the first couple of ones seem to be focused sort of on um, school context. So the first one comes from Alin, and they say um, they teach in a school in Bradford with the majority of Indian and Pakistani school. Would you argue that it is better to teach empire from a more Indian perspective? Or would you say that in order for them to get a true or more complex narrative, it should be taught from the English centric perspective? Really good and interesting question. Um, and my view would, um, maybe not kind of perspective, but I would, I would say that it's really important to, to think carefully about the, the relationship between your history curriculum and your school community. Yeah. So I would say, it, you know, if you're teaching lots of students in Bradford of South Asian heritage, then really important that you have masses of that South Asian history in your curriculum. And the starting point is South Asia, not Britain. <laughs> so absolutely, you know, I think that that's so important, really. Um, uh, obviously, that's not to say that other aspects of the British Empire shouldn't be part of your curriculum. Uh, really, really important. But um, you, you, just, you, you just really see that, don't you? You see the students light up and become really, really interested when they see that actually it's part of their heritage, no? Mm. Uh, and, and, um, and part of their mul multiple identities. I've always been taken by uh, Amatia Sen's argument about what we really need to do and think about the relationship between history and identity is think about how our subject can, um, can reinforce 
uh, our students' multiple identities, the fact that they are British and Asian, uh, and a whole mixture of other things, you know? That's really, really important, I think. But yeah, I would definitely want to do that uh, if I was teaching there. And I would want to be, you know, um, well, it's really interesting in the north of England, isn't it? I heard Jim Walvin speak recently, um, and he's published a recent book called uh, History of uh, Slavery in Small Things. And um, he, he's in his 70s, I think, now. So he was brought up in Manchester in, in he said, the 1950s as a child. And he looked out um, at all these um, uh, cotton mills, at the chimneys from the cotton mills, you know, two, three hundred of them that he could see from a hill near his house. And he made no connection between this and empire. <laughs> and um, I think for those students there now, still in the north of England, that connection between uh, cotton production, particularly cotton production, you know, and the link between, say, Manchester and Bombay is really, really important, you know, because at, it, it, after the American or during the American Civil War, when the, cotton, the raw cotton supplies dry up from the United States of America, that's when Bombay really takes off, you know? Um, so I think these links between where we're teaching history and the, the, the identities and the, the heritage of our students, it is re they are really fundamentally important to make, absolutely. Fabulous. I think that sort of also answers um, Katie's, well, in a way, addresses Katie's question. She talks about how she works in a very multicultural school and she was looking at doing some sort of empire research project. So the students aligned with their heritage, I suppose, can research their own in, like interests and connections. So yeah. exactly how you're saying, I suppose, if you provide an empire inquiry that makes those people feel seen then they can apply they can address it like that yeah. um, but Jen actually talks about um, something that I think is really important is that obviously you talked you about using a lot of scholarship um, and she says that obviously there's a need for this teacher subject knowledge so how do you think that departments can sort of support or facilitate this to develop that knowledge? Yeah that, that's a really good question and, and obviously sessions like this are really important in that aren't they? So, you know, fr from my session where I, I may have recommended, you know, over a dozen history books this evening, yeah, I, I would say a good place to start is just as a department, where do any of these books that you haven't read yet link into your curriculum or link to any way in which you're, you want to develop your history curriculum um, uh, and uh, all read the same book? I'm, I'm really struck by this. I mean, I, I think, you know, there are really good models of the way in which, you know, you know, all these um, wonderful people who've linked with Miranda Kaufman after the publication of her book, Black Tudors. Um, and uh, I mean, they were lucky to get some funding to, to work for a weekend together and then, you know, take off and, and develop various things. But uh, another example I, I mentioned earlier, you know, Peter Frankopan's book on Silk Roads. I know, I know these are not directly related to Empire, but the, the model there of lots of people reading the same book and then getting that together to think, well, what are the implications in terms of our curriculum uh, and our curriculum planning? And what, 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 what are the important, uh, what important aspects of knowledge and understanding do we want to get across in the light of this scholarship? How can then that lead on to uh, inquiry questions and the focus for inquiries? So I would say, you know, first point, Think about which aspects of empire you want to develop and then all engage with the same scholarship and just enjoy it, you know, um, and it's often something we do in holidays because we're too tired in term times, isn't it, to recreate tomes. So. <laughs> Yeah, I do, I do think those are, the subject knowledge is so important for those like layers and complexity, exactly as you were saying, because you can't really, you, you need that. Um, so there's a couple more. Um, so another Emma states, uh, she works with students that have like social, emotional, mental health needs. Um, and she sort of struggled to engage them with these trippy, tricky topics. Um, do you think there's a way that you could approach Empire as a way in to help this at all? Yeah, that's a really good question. And and kind of in that particular context, you know, beyond my particular expertise, really, mm. I mean, you know, your students um, and um, and it depends on their specific needs. Um, but I, I think approaches like, for example, the Akan drum approach. You know, 
through a particular artifact um, using kind of images of those artifacts and, and returning to them. Uh, I mean, it's interesting that, you know, when I've taught that inquiry to a whole range of different students with, you know, with different needs, um, and we've addressed some difficult histories through, through that drum, um, they've kind of found it quite reassuring returning to the drum <laughs> and writing as the drum and, and all kind of being on this journey together that, okay, we, we're going through this journey. There'll be some, we'll encounter some challenging things as we move uh, on this journey, but there's kind of safety in the drum because it's distant, really. And I, f I found that really, really helpful, to be honest. Um, and, and my students have too. So even though I'm no expert, I would say that that's an approach to maybe, to maybe really try. Uh, kind, of, kind of not shying away from the difficult histories, but thinking how you can distance your student from it in some way. Um, I mean, there's, there's some wonderful work done by um, Alison Kitson and, um, and Alan McCulley in a Northern Ireland context many years ago now, but published in Teaching History, um, looking at teachers who were risk-taking, you know, and what they um, used to get kids thinking about the history from both communities in Northern Ireland were proxies. You know? they, ha they had these people who were, um, uh, who were from, from both uh, communities who had kind of extreme views. And these were the mouths that the, that the students spoke through, really, to help them understand their perspectives. So I think often that distancing from the past is is um, is really helpful. Um, yeah. Um, and then just to sort of bring us to our last one then, and then I'll, we'll let everybody go. Um, I guess because we're trying to move away from this old school sort of balance sheet situation. However, somebody does ask, um, is there anything positive that we should teach about the British Empire? What an interesting question. And I mean, as you've probably gathered from now, uh, from by now, um, I think on the whole, it was a, a, a very bad thing <laughs> for the world. <laughs> um, having said that, and I think it is, I think it's really important to get across the material greed that often underpinned it, the racism and the ultraviolence. But at the same time, I think it's important to, uh, to get across the complexity in terms of there were always people doing good things within it. You know? if, if you read Gilmore's book, David Gilmore's book on, on the British in India, there were people who were doing things there um, that, that, that were improving people's lives. You know? And I think it's important to, to acknowledge those things. And, um, uh, but the key to it is teaching about the complexity you know, uh, and moving beyond the, the colonizers and the colonized and exploring the diverse experiences and attitudes within those broad groups in any different, in any different context. And this is where I think it's important to come down to the, to the kind of the particular, you know? um, and you know, the Roanoke inquiry is, is an example of that, you know, um, uh, uh, Richard Grenville, who led the expedition, and uh, Ralph Lane were ex-soldiers, uh, particularly belligerent. And one of the reasons that it resulted in um, uh, conflict and trauma quite quickly was because of the belligerence and the attitudes of the, these two men. Whereas John White um, has a much more benign approach and, and is much more culturally sensitive. Uh, so is Thomas Harriot, the other Oxford intellectual who joins, and is, he's a cartographer and a linguist. So, you know, Harriet and White uh, are very different people uh, from Grenville and Lane. And I think it's really important to explore that kind of complexity when we're teaching about empire. Yeah. It's such a pertinent place to, to finish. Um, and actually, I remember longer ago than I care to remember now really um, being actually in a session with the Michael and, and going through um, that inquiry and it, it is it, it's incredibly interesting especially I remember actually you um, taking us through the um, the story of their journey over there um, and it being 
an absolutely wonderful story and, and an absolutely wonderful lesson. So, so I thank you for that. And I thank you, of course, for, for this evening. Um, I think I, I would echo everybody's thoughts on here right now that it's been absolutely fantastic and, and, a, and an absolute treat. So, so thank you ever so much. Really hope you enjoyed this recording. Before you go, please just do us one really quick favour and just click subscribe to our YouTube channel. We know it's a chore, but it's gonna make such a huge difference to the network as we try to grow. Thank you.